And uh, the final speaker in this uh, Kavli special section on uh, forefront physics for real world problems is Stephen Harris. Stephen is a project scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And he will be telling us about forefront research in batteries for electric vehicles. Stephen. OK, now it works. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to talk about failure in lithium ion batteries. And here's my one page uh, primer on how batteries work. They have two electrodes. Each is a porous composite material on one side. Um, you, make, you have a material that makes a strong bond with lithium, like lithium cobalt oxide. On the other side, you have a material that makes a weak bond with lithium, such as graphite. In the pores, you put a solvent like this, and lithium PF6 is a, is a salt. Um, and uh, the action of a lithium ion battery is for the lithium to go back and forth from one side to the other, and it actually goes into, intercalates in, or inserts into the, chemically into the material. So um, when lithium is part of a strongly bonded system, such as lithium cobalt oxide, uh, its free energy is low, and by this uh, rule that delta G is minus the voltage, if the free energy is low, the voltage is high, and so that makes a positive electrode. And on the other hand, if you have, uh, a, if lithium is part of a weakly bonded system, like on graphite, uh, then the free energy of the lithium is high, so the voltage is low, that makes it a negative electrode. All right, so the battery community, at least in the automotive game, uh, wants higher energy density. That's, that's what they want. And um, uh, there's only a few ways to get it. I can think of four. And so I want to ask, what is our fundamental understanding of these four different ways of trying to get higher energy density? So one way is to have higher capacity. That means more lithium atoms per gram of stuff. Um, and I've, uh, I've colored this green because um, we understand this pretty well. If you give the battery community the name of a new material, they can tell you with quite a bit of accuracy how much lithium will come out as a function of voltage. The second way to get higher energy density is with higher voltage. Um, now, we have electrodes that have high voltage already. What we don't have are electrolytes that can withstand those high voltages. They, they get oxidized and end up coating the electrodes uh, and making the battery die. Um, I colored this yellow because if you give the battery community the name of a new um, electrolyte, they may make a, a reasonable guess uh, at how stable it is at high voltage, but maybe not. And then the third approach is to have higher mass density, in other words, lower porosity. And um, uh, of course, if you have less porosity, you have more energy density. But I've colored this sort of a reddish orange. Uh, because it's generally believed that if you cut down the porosity, um, uh, you're going to make the tortuosity, the transport kinetics through the electrode so bad that you're going to make the power uh, unacceptably low. So I'm going to try and convince you this isn't right at the end. And the last way to make uh, higher energy density, which is a little less obvious, is uh, longer life batteries. And the reason is that today, uh, vehicle manufacturers substantially oversize their batteries to give them longer life. So in, in some of the uh, uh, plug-in electrics, for example, the, the car may only use 60 or 70 percent of the energy in there. Um, so you're wasting a third. Uh, if we could magically make these batteries last longer, then we could get a 50 percent increase in energy density just by accessing all the energy in there. Um, so I've colored this one red because if given a new battery system, we have no idea whatsoever how to predict whether its durability is going to be high, low, or in between. Um, and um, there's a couple of reasons for that, I think. One is that there seems to be a whole lot of different failure mechanisms. It can fail electrically, mechanically, morphologically. Um, there's just a lot of different failure mechanisms, and they don't seem to have anything to do with each other. And so the field is kind of splintered. There's no sort of high level or unified picture of what failure is. Um, this, perhaps the second reason is that until the auto industry came into the game five years ago or so, um, the fact that batteries lasted two or three years was just fine. They, they satisfied the audience they had of, of um, uh, cell phones and laptops. So it's only recent that, that durability is uh, so critical. So how should we think about durability of batteries? The way we think about everything in the, in the lithium battery game is through uh, 
John Newman's macrohomogeneous model, which he developed uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and it's a um, model that makes a lot of assumptions. Uh, materials are homogeneous. Transport is always one dimension or so. Um, but it's, uh, it predicts uh, battery performance. And once you've um, set the adjustable parameters, it allows you to optimize the properties of a battery, like to make trade-offs between energy and power, for example. And it's been so remarkably successful that um, the battery industry using this model has been able to more than double the energy density of lithium-ion batteries without changing anything in the chemistry. Now, there's nothing in this model that talks about degradation. Um, and I don't think Newman ever tried to. But other people have used this as a sort of framework to study durability. And typically, the way you do that is you introduce some sort of uh, mechanism. You give it a time dependence. And in the end, you add a parameter or two, and you predict durability. But none of these sorts of models have any transferability. Um, so my history before I got into batteries about five years ago, I was working in fracture mechanics. And uh, in, in that uh, field, the only thing that matters is inhomogeneities. And so it seemed odd that uh, the battery field wasn't even thinking about them. And so um, um, this shows a picture, a cross-section of a lithium-ion battery cathode came out of a positive electrode that came out of a Toshiba laptop. Uh, you can see uh, here is the uh, current collector. There is lithium cobalt oxide particles on both sides. Those are the white things. The black is where I've infused uh, an epoxy uh, just to fill the pores. Um, now, if you think about this, if, if this um, were really, let's say, a one-dimensional material, then you have these two little particles I've circled. And they're both about the same size, and they're both about the same depth into the electrode uh, from here down. Um, but this guy over here is sitting next to a, a pretty big pore. And so you might imagine that transport to and from that particle is going to be pretty easy, whereas this guy looks like he's surrounded, at least in 2D. And you might imagine that uh, this guy um, has trouble getting uh, any lithium to it or from it. And so you might imagine that these two particles have very different environments. So what I set for myself uh, as a goal in, in, in batteries was to try and understand the impact of inhomogeneities. First, I wanted to identify what they are and what scale they they exist on, describe them as quantitatively as possible, and ask the question, do they matter? So in this case, the um, inhomogeneities are on the scale of the electrode thickness, which is 50 or 100 microns. But there's inhomogeneities at every scale. So I've cut open a graphite particle here and a lithium cobalt oxide particle here. They're, they're both layered materials. You can see they're full of all sorts of complicated things uh, on the sort of one micron scale, pores, cracks. And then if you go down farther, uh, you can see uh, finer cracks. Basically, there's inhomogeneities at, at every link scale. So how would we imagine we're going to relate degradation to inhomogeneities? And to do this, I'm going to uh, propose two hypotheses. Um, the first one is pretty simple. Battery failure begins at an inhomogeneity, which is nothing more than what pretty much every material does, um, but wasn't in the battery field. Uh, the second idea is that battery failure is related to failure of lithium ion transport. And the, the reason I, I propose this is that in a lith working lithium ion battery, the only thing that should happen is lithium goes back and forth between the electrodes. And so I imagine that if a, a battery is failing, let's imagine that that must be because lithium isn't getting to the right place at the right time. So that's a lithium transport problem. So whether or not these two hypotheses are true, they have some uh, uh, great benefits uh, in, in case they're true. Um, the first thing is it tells you what you should study. You should be looking at lithium ion transport at the microscale. And the second benefit, it tells you, in principle, how to fix things, deal with the inhomogeneities. So lithium transport occurs over many length scales. Um, you see lithium transport between particles, within a particle. And then there are these degradation films I mentioned earlier that coat particles, and lithium has to get across them. Um, I've worked on all of these. I'm just going to talk about the first two. So let's start about trans with transport between particles. So um, originally, there was pretty much no quantitative information about interparticle heterogeneity. And instead, it was assumed that there were these homogeneous properties like porosity and tortuosity that were constant in time and space. 
So I wanted to ask, um, is that true? So, so uh, how do we envision, how, how do we view lithium ions moving around? They, they have no real convenient spectra, um, but they do have a, one convenient feature which was well known at the time, and that is that when lithium ions go into graphite, they change the color of graphite. So whereas um, uh, graphite may start out uh, gray, you, once it's about 50% lithiated, it turns blue, and then at about 75% lithiated, it turns red, and near 100% lithiated, it turns gold. So I figured I could use this as a way to monitor where the lithium was going. So the problem is that you normally, el electrodes are facing each other and you can't look inside. So what I did is I said, we're going to have an open sandwich version of these electrodes. You know, put them next to each other, called planar, with a little gap in between where we would put electrolyte and then we could let lithium go back and forth from through the edges, one to the other. So here is a side view of, of a, the cell I used. There's, um, there's uh, electro two electrodes next to each other there. Uh, sitting on spring-loaded steel pieces. There's a window above it, a uh, piece of Teflon to keep the steel pieces from touching each other. So if you look down on it, you can see the two electrodes. Here's a piece of graphite, about a centimeter square. Here's a piece of lithium. Between it is that piece of, of uh, Teflon. But above the Teflon, next to the two edges, you can put electrolyte in there, and then lithium can travel uh, from one to the other. Um, so um, this sort of geometry has some nice advantages apart from letting me just see, see things, uh, see colors. Uh, also, the concentration gradients are now spread out over a centimeter instead of 100 microns, so that's easier to see. Um, of course, everything is very slow, and, uh, but also any variability that's in the uh, transport will be obvious, um, or at least that's the idea. So I'm going to zoom in on a little piece of this electrode. The, the lithium is going to be traveling from south to north, that is, from the lithium metal into the graphite. So you're going to see color move south to north. And so here is a video. This took uh, like a day, um, a, a picture every 20 minutes. And so, whoops. OK, so the first thing you'll notice is that the color is moving from south to north. But then you're going to start seeing little balls of lithium metal uh, that appear and grow. They nucleate and they grow. Um, this is uh, very dangerous in lithium batteries. Um, it has to be avoided. The um, insertion of lithium into graphite is activated. There's some sort of barrier. And so if you throw lithium at the graphite too fast, it can't get in. And so as a second best alternative, the lithium grabs an electron and electroplates. And the problem is that, that uh, these little nuclei here can grow and form dendrites, puncture the um, separator, and cause a short circuit. As a result, uh, this has to be avoided at all costs. And so batteries are charged very, very slowly, many hours. This is why it takes so long to charge lithium batteries. Uh, and that's not good for customers. So there's been tons of work on, of course, on thinking about uh, lithium plating in batteries. And the typical paper will address a question like, well, how does plating respond to some change I make in its environment or it's in the conditions? But if your mind is sort of thinking about inhomogeneities all the time, you might ask different questions. For example, there's only about a dozen or so of these nuclei that are, that are formed. How come so few? Maybe that means that uh, some spots on the graphite are, have something special to them that seems to promote lithiation. Of course, once a, a bunch of nuclei start growing, then transport limit, it may limit the number of nuclei you form, but you can still ask why do you form a nucleus uh, here and not, and not there. Um, if, if there is a reason, then maybe we can control or learn to control or, uh, the, the, this uh, plating. Um, but in general, we expect that nucleation is going to be strongly affected by transport between uh, between the nuclei as, as lithium may get uh, depleted. And so if we're going to make a serious attempt to understand that, we have to understand transport in these electrodes, and that means three in three dimensions. So um, what I decided to do to get some information about 3D microstructure is I contacted Nigel Brandon and Paul Shearing at Imperial College who do uh, X-ray tomography. And so um, we, we cut up a little piece of graphite uh, shown here. It's about uh, under a half a millimeter in each direction. What you're seeing is 43 microns thick. The electrode was actually 86 microns thick, and I asked the computer just to show me only half of it. I'll show you why in a minute. 
So the question is, um, oops, sorry. So the question is, uh, how do we identify whether there is inhomogeneity and whether it matters? So here are two of the equations that show up in Newman's models, and I don't want to talk about them at all, except to mention that you see in the first equation you have this kappa effective, that's the effective conductivity of a lithium ion while it's wandering through that complicated 3D microstructure. And in the second equation you have D effective, that's the effective diffusion coefficient uh, for, the, for uh, lithium transport in the electrode. So the, the definition of these effective parameters is you take the bulk values, kappa and D, and you multiply them by the porosity. So if it's 10% porous, your effective transport is cut factor of 10. And then whatever that is, you divide by what's called the tortuosity factor, which is a number which is actually defined uh, in this equation, and basically it tells you by what factor is transport slowed down because the pathway is so tortuous and complex, has to go a longer way. Typically, the porosity is around 0.4, the tortuosity is around 5, so that transport within the electrode is perhaps an order of magnitude lower than it is in the, in the bulk. And so um, this, this is, um, uh, brings up a, 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 an unfortunate trade-off that people um, accept, and that is that um, for random microstructures, you, 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 it, when the porosity goes down, the tortuosity goes up and vice versa. And what that means is you can, you can get a high energy battery with low porosity, or you can get a high power battery with low tortuosity, but you can't get both. And that's, that is a shame if it's really true. So what do you think about if, if, if inhomogeneities are on your mind? Um, you could ask, is the tortuosity inhomogeneous and on what scale? Uh, you can ask whether the variability in the tortuosity leads to state of charge variability. And if so, is that important? So um, what I did is I took each of those 43 micron thick pieces, really two halves of a single graphite electrode, and divided them in the mind of the computer into 12 little rectangles, about 80 or 100 microns in each box, each, each little box. So there were 24 little sub-regions. And then we used a finite element calculation to calculate the diffusion coefficient um, or the diffusion rate through the electrode. And so what we really need to do to get the tortuosity is we want the ratio. So, so if this is the um, electrode, you start with a particle on one side and you ask, you, you let it diffuse through the structure that you've just got from tomography. And you say, how long does it take to get to the other side? And now you take the uh, electrode away and say, now how long does it take to get, go the same distance? And uh, knowing the porosity, you can calculate the tortuosity from the ratio of those two times. So we calculated the tortuosity and porosity, which you just get directly, uh, for each of these 24 boxes. And I'll show you the results for one of them. The other one looks essentially the same. So the um, blue is the porosity on the left. The one I want you to focus on is the uh, tortuosity, which is the red data and on the right. So first of all, what you see is that on the average, the porosity is around 5, which is what you expect. But the, uh, there's some variability. Most of the little boxes have tortuosities that are not so far from the average. But there's two outliers. Um, outlier number, the first outlier, sample number 3, uh, has a very high tortuosity, like 10. And what that means is that uh, there's, the lithium is going to get backed up going through there. So if you're a lithium atom and you're approaching the electrode near uh, subsample number three, you're probably going to try and go around it. What this means is that there's going to be inefficient charging there. Um, basically, you've got material there which is not going to get charged. Uh, and also, you're throwing off some of the uh, um, current density onto its neighbors. And high current density is a bad thing for battery durability. On the other hand, uh, subsample number 11 is much worse. Uh, here we have a very low tortuosity, around two or three. And that means that everybody's going to try and funnel into that little, little rectangle. Um, as a result, the current density there is going to be very high, and batteries can't tolerate high current density. If, the, if this is a negative electrode, it's going to plate. If it's a positive electrode, the voltage is going to go really high, and it's going to destroy the electrolyte because it's going to oxidize it. So when you actually take an, a, a battery like this and spec it, what is the maximum safe charging rate and what is the maximum safe state of charge, those numbers are going to be determined by the outliers. And so because of, of 
little regions like number 11, you have to charge much more slowly than you would if the thing were homogeneous. And similarly, you, 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 have to, you can only go to a much lower state of charge because you have to worry about places like number 11. That's part of why you don't charge and discharge batteries very deeply if you want them to live. Well, if we only had a homogeneous electrode, we should be able to do a lot better. So that's a qualitative um, picture of why heterogeneity might be important. But to make it quantitative, I collaborated with Edwin Garcia at Purdue. And he had built really the only um, three-dimensional model that was capable of importing X-ray tomography data, which, which we had. So, so what he did is he imported our, our uh, electrode and then ran some, uh, um, some charging experiments. Um, this shows a histogram of um, what fraction of the electrode is at what state of charge after 1,200 seconds, 20 minutes. So this is at a uh, moderate uh, charging rate, nothing particularly fast. Um, and so after 20 minutes, you're about half charged. What it shows is, is that there are sort of three regimes, that there, there are some of these um, regions that are uh, effectively shielded. This is wasted material that hardly gets charged at all. Most of the material is, is average. Uh, but then uh, there's some of the stuff which is getting overcharged. And, and that's very dangerous, particularly when you look at this region where it's piling up against one. So there's, there's a non-negligible amount of graphite which is full, even at half, uh, overall half charge. That means if you try and put more lithium there, it's going to plate. And so what you see is that a, a pretty substantial fraction of this electrode uh, is either inefficiently charged or dangerous. And so this, this means that the, the, the inhomogeneities are playing actually quantitatively, you can say they're playing a pretty significant role in limiting what the battery can do. Now, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is transport within particles. And again, there's been no real quantitative information about intraparticle inhomogeneity. What's been assumed is that you, the transport is one-dimensional in composite particles. So like I showed you before, when, when you look inside these particles, you've got a lot of little grains. And if you assume that the grains are pretty small and they're randomly oriented and there's a lot of them, then you can say, well, we might as well treat it as, as isotropic. And so that's part of what's always assumed. The other thing that's always assumed is that transport is by bulk diffusion only, solid phase diffusion. So we can ask, um, uh, this is called the shrinking core model, and we can ask whether it's valid. Um, the shrinking core model predicts uh, a uniform state of charge on any radius by definition. And that one radius uh, that's of interest to me, if I have spherical particles, is the surface, since that's the only radius I can see. And so if the shrinking core model is going to be right, then what you have to see is that the surface is going to be always monochromatic, uh, whatever, black, blue, red, or gold. And so I'm going to show you a video now of, of an electrode. These are 10 micron diameter spherical particles. And again, the lithiation is coming from south to north. And what I believe I see is that no particle ever uh, is converted to uh, ha having being monochromatic on the surface. By the way, each frame here is about 20 minutes. You're looking at close to a day. So there's plenty of time for you know, minor perturbations to, to uh, wash out. So what this tells me is that, in fact, um, lithiation is not at all isotropic. Every particle has a hot spot, and lithiation starts there, and then turns that little spot colored, and then the um, tra transport maybe within the particle uh, is, is uh, or maybe without it. But anyway, transport is then filling in the rest of the particle. The shrinking core model is invalid, in other words. And so we can ask why not, and we can ask does it matter. So um, to look a little more detail at what's going on inside particles, I teamed up with Scott Barnett at Northwestern University. Uh, he has a focused ion beam, and we took that uh, lithium cobalt oxide electrode that I showed you earlier from the same battery as from the graphite. Um, and I started slicing it with a focused ion beam. And we, we, we did what's called serial sectioning. You take a series of, of cuts uh, through this thing. And uh, so you can see. These are just a few selected images. Um, and what you can see is as we step through uh, deeper and deeper, different particles come into and out of uh, 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 the field of vision. Now, as you look at this, there's two things, I think, that stand out. 
Uh, again, the white is the lithium cobalt oxide, the black is the epoxy. The first thing that stands out is that um, there's all these little black regions inside a lot of the particles. That's epoxy that got in. What that demonstrates is that the um, pores and cracks in, in these particles percolate all the way to the surface. So if epoxy can get in, electrolyte can get in. And that means that lithium has another way in. That why are we limiting ourselves to assuming that it's only bulk transport? If you're a lithium ion and you're trying to get to the center of that guy, you might uh, first go by a, uh, the, the cracks and then only at the very end go through um, bulk. The second thing that's sort of uh, amusing, uh, if, you, if you look at the, this picture um, and you said, well, these are sort of complicated shapes, but more or less they're mostly convex. And so why shouldn't we, we should be able to uh, get some reasonable approximation of, of these particles with, let's say, an ellipsoid, if not a, a, a sphere. Um, and that looks really good, but, it, um, but it's an illusion because the, these particles are actually connected to each other in the third dimension. And so if you reconstruct these particles uh, from the ones I just showed you, they're actually very complex and they're full of holes. Look at this big, deep crevice in that particle. And, and it's hard to believe that, um, that um, uh, liquid phase transport isn't playing a, a very large role. Now, it, it doesn't, it, whether or not this matters depends on your point of view. If, if you're trying to, to uh, optimize an electrode, it doesn't really matter because you're still going to fit this, your model to a, a, a spherical transport. Uh, what that really means is you measure how long it takes to fill up the particle, you assume it's a sphere, you get a diffusion coefficient out of it. But from the point of view of a, of, a, of a battery, all you care is how long does it take to fill the, fill the particles, and that doesn't care what you think is the diffusion coefficient. On the other hand, if you're really trying to act, extract diffusion coefficients from this, then you can get badly misled. And, and as you can see, um, people looking at diffusion coefficients get numbers that vary all over the world because what they're looking at is not what they are modeling. Okay, so let me um, sort of wrap up. Uh, um, my picture is uh, that performance of batteries can be very well predicted with models that homogenize all the materials, given that you're allowed to adjust the parameters uh, on every system appropriately. Um, inhomogeneities, I think, play a role not in performance, but in the performance limits. So. Um, if, you, if you want to improve or you want to wonder why the maximum safe charging rate or the maximum power is a certain amount, um, then that's, that I would claim is likely due to some, some inhomogeneity somewhere. Same with the maximum safe state of charge. So what should we do? So I'm going to, uh, this is a poem from my childhood uh, about a deacon who decided to build a one-horse shea that would never fail. And it says, but the deacon swore as deacons do with an I do vow or an I tell you. He would build one shay to beat the town and the county and all the country round. It should be so built that it couldn't break down. For, said the deacon, it's mighty plain that the weakest place must stand the strain. And the way to fix it, as I maintain, is only just to make that place as strong as the rest. And if you want to find out what happened to his wonderful shay, you have to read the poem. But, but the idea is that uh, things break at a weak spot, and the solution is get rid of the weak spots. So what can we do? So here's a, a, a simple-minded idea. I, I mentioned a couple of times, I think, that porosity and tortuosity go in opposite directions. If you, if you make it denser, you've got to, you, you, you're penalized because the tortuosity is going bad. And that's true, but what I said, and maybe you didn't notice, is I said for random structures. But it's not at all true for design structures. Why are we making, using, you know, 16th century technology to make electrodes? So on the right here, on the left is that electrode I showed you before. On the right is a, is a fishbowl with a bunch of marbles in it. And if you pour the marbles in and shake it a little bit, what you discover is that it, it packs pretty well. Um, you know, it's not perfect hexagonal close packed. I've got a few little circles that show you hexagonal close pack. In, in fact, it turns out that um, the density in these things instead of being 40% um, porous, maybe only 25% porous. That means a 25% increase about in the energy density. Now, you'd expect that if you ever had such a low porosity in a battery, your tortuosity would be a zillion, but it's not. In fact, the, the tortuosity in this structure is two, not 
five. And so not only do you get 25% more energy, you more than double the transport coefficients. And from my point of view, you get another benefit, and that is you've, 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 made the, uh, you've reduced the intensity of inhomogeneities, and so it may last longer. If it lasts longer, then uh, you don't have to cut back on the fraction of the battery you're using, so you get more energy density that way. Longer life means smaller batteries. Now, it's more complicated than that, I think, because as I thought about, you know, okay, how do we just get rid of all inhomogeneities? You know, um, some inhomogeneities are good. If you want to make some things hard, you, you introduce dislocations. So what you really want to do is understand and control the inhomogeneities. You don't want to just lay down. I mean, these, these uh, electrodes are made by pouring uh, graphite that's been crushed into a cauldron and adding eye of newt and stirring it, and then you throw it onto the electrode and... and Okay, so maybe we can do better than that. Um, and maybe we should try and uh, understand how these inhomogeneities either help or hurt, but it certainly affect how these batteries uh, uh, survive. You know, it, knowing about a single inhomogeneity is also not good enough. If you have one electrocatalyst particle sitting on a flat surface, for example, in an electrochemical reaction, that may be very different from a whole zoo of, of uh, polydispersed particles spread out in a, in a, uh, in a porous electrode. So the final line is that, um, so my picture is that failure involves, this like a lot of good words, dynamic coupling among inhomogeneities across length scales. Thank you. That was wonderful. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes. Yes, um, at the National Magnet Lab, over here to your right. Um, we're developing lithium MRI to get three-dimensional in situ images of lithium batteries. Resolution is about 50 microns now, and I'm wondering how far we have to go to sort of get your attention and for which problem do you think 3D imaging would be most useful? Yeah, I've been really interested in, in, in that possibility. Um, um, 50 microns, I think, is not good enough because the largest scale um, I mean, from my particular point of view, it, it may be different in other systems. If you're looking at a single electrode, the electrode thickness is likely to be around 50 microns. Yeah. Where that would be useful would be if you had a stacked electrode. So, for example, in an automobile, the, you might have 20 or 30 electrodes stacked on each other in a pouch. And so you might ask, uh, okay, so here's what you'd, you'd ask, um, you know, is one electrode doing the same thing as the next electrode? Uh, and we don't have answers to that sort of thing. Undoubtedly, out of 20, uh, electrodes, one of them is not as good as the others, and so one of them is either getting overcharged or undercharged, and we have no idea. So if you could do, if you could look at a stack of electrodes with 50 micron resolution, that would be awesome. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Right, we have a question in the middle. Yeah, if you had the uh, opportunity to fly home on a 787, uh, <laughs> would you do it? With, with respect uh, to the lithium batteries? You no, know, this is sort of a political question. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, but, uh, look, okay, here, here's what I think. Are, are they going to fix? Uh, is yeah, yeah. is a fi fix yeah. reliable? As, as far as I can tell from reading, you know, newspapers and who knows what that means, there's no reason why this should have ever happened. Uh, I, I mean, the, the batteries, is, I mean, maybe they were exposed, they were, maybe they put them on the, on the wings, I don't know. But, I mean, you know, a lithium battery sitting in a, in a nice, comfortable chamber should never, ever do what that battery did. It, it probably got overheated somehow, and it, it shouldn't have been allowed to overheat. These batteries are, I think, only this big. Uh, another thing to think about is, I don't, I don't know how many lithium batteries are on there. I've, one person told me only a few. Um, you know, you save 50% in weight when you go to a lithium battery. So if there were a couple hundred pounds of lithium battery, and you, uh, a battery, and you can save 100 pounds, that's sort of a big deal in a car, but for a 787, if you're only going to save a few hundred pounds, why would you do it? But, but I really don't know the details. The bottom line is there's no reason why a, a lithium battery in an in a air-conditioned environment and well-controlled environment should ever do anything bad. Great. We have a question from Stephen Chu, the physicist. I, I don't want to cut in line. Okay. Let's go over here, and then we'll give Steve the last question. Uh, sorry, I'll try to get this quick. Um, I was wondering about what architectures might have been used for ordered 
uh, cathodes? Uh, are nanopillars something that makes sense? Have they been explored? Okay, so um, I should say don't get me started. Um, I have a particular view which maybe is um, idiosyncratic. Um, my view is that all of the efforts to uh, put nano scale material into the negative electrode, they're, they're all misguided for a few reasons. Um, the advantage of nano is often that you get more surface area and therefore higher rates, and that's true. But in batteries, especially on the negative electrode, there are parasitic reactions which also scale with surface area. And I mean, the reason that battery particles are 10 microns is not because the battery people didn't know about nanoparticles. It's because when you get much smaller than about 10 microns, you get overwhelmed by these degradation uh, uh, parasitic reactions, and you consume all the lithium on cycle number one with these parasitic reactions. Now, in the papers that you see, that doesn't happen, but that's because they're invariably using a lithium metal electrode as the opposite electrode, and you have an infinite supply of lithium. So, so one problem with nanostructures on the negative side, this doesn't apply to the positive side, but on, on the negative side is that um, the, the surface area is, is so large that, it, that you can't run a battery this way. Another problem that has to be addressed is packing density. So I'm not an expert, but my understanding is uh, it's really hard to pack um, uh, nanostructures uh, very well. The, the answer isn't, I don't think, to, to drop the idea of nanostructures on the negative side, but it's to be careful about them. So, for example, um, you don't, graphite already has so much capacity, you don't really get much uh, extra by, by uh, putting a, a, having a, a negative electrode more capacity. Um, and uh, so this shows the amount of weight from graphite, that's the green. If you cut that a factor of two, that's not much worse than a factor of 10. It's not that big of a deal. And so you don't need pure silicon nano structures. You might find that, that decorating the graphite with little tiny bits of silicon, even if the silicon is only 10% in weight by weight of the graphite, that might be great. And then you double your, your capacity, which is all anybody ever wants. So I think the, the people doing nanostructures, you know, they can do great material science. A lot of it doesn't have much to do with batteries. But if you want to have something to do with batteries, there's good stuff to do, but, but you know, talk to a battery person. And the last question, Steve Chu. Well, actually, I was listening to your other answer, and um, I just want to make a comment before my real question. Uh, the, uh, at the nanomeso scale, they are doing the oldest things, decorations and things like that, uh, yes, as yes. you well know. Yes, and yes. so it, rather than, so just so the Right, right, know, I mean, I think that's a great actually, idea. They actually are doing that, and, it, and they're getting, that's one of the drivers for higher capacity. Yeah, both yeah. Both on the cathode and the nano side. My question is the following. I agree. Um, on, on the lithium ion battery is most fragile when it's um, depleted 5% to, uh, 5% of its full capacity, 10%. Um, it's known phenomenologically you have to be very, very careful about charging at the 5, 10, 15, 20% level. As a warning to all the people who have computers, go into your system and don't let it ever discharge below 25%. You can do that in your uh, Windows system. Um, and you have to charge very slowly. It's known phenomenologically. While you were describing your model, I was listening to whether that's modeled. And at the high end, after 95% charge, you never want to charge beyond 95%. That's where the dendritic formation is occurring. I was, the question is, have you, I was listening for, a lot of the dendritic formation, either speed charging or the last little bit, is what I know from talking to battery manufacturers phenomenologically. Have you begin, tried to model a, a, a fundamental, more fundamental understanding of this stuff? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you look at, at these pictures, for example, um, uh, where the battery, uh, where you start forming dendrites or nucleate lithium, um, you, I, I originally expected that you'd form the nuclei on the particles that were gold, the most lithiated, but in fact, that's not true. So I think the, uh, you, you can lithiate a, 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 a battery, you can, I'm sorry, you can form dendrites on a battery with very low states of charge if you charge too fast or if it's very cold, so that you just put an insuperable barrier over it and it'll, it, 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 even if, if thermodynamically there's, it's got plenty of room for, 
for uh, lithium to go in. Kinetically, it may not be able to get there, and so it'll just plate. So, so yeah, they, they do charge very, very slowly at the, at the end. That's for a number of reasons, including the fact that lithium transport inside these materials gets very slow when you're near... No, near actually, I, I wasn't asking that. I was Sorry. asking at the, at the low charge, we know you have to charge very slowly. At the high charge, they slow up for a lot of reasons, but that's where a lot of... Dam at the low end and the high end, that's where all, most of the battery damage occurs. And I was asking whether you can model that on a more fundamental principle. Yeah. Okay, so th those, um, those, um, the models that I showed, I showed you one histogram from Garcia, so we've collaborated on that, and we've, we have a lot of modeling uh, of, of under what conditions do you get plating, for example, in different, um, uh, under different conditions. Right now, that's almost the only experimental data that exists, and I think almost the only model that exists, so, so we, it, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff we could do. That's all we've got so far. It's not even published yet. But yeah, we are doing 3D modeling of real electrodes to get at that sort of question. Uh, so uh, let's thank Stephen. And uh, I, would, I would like to end this session by thanking all the speakers for a very lively session and again acknowledging the support of the Kavli Foundation.